Hey guys, Carlson here to wrap up the year with you with Unit 10, the Reproductive System, which covers Chapter 19. Uh, the first section of the chapter is just going to talk about those basic reproductive parts. Uh, this system ensures the continued existence of the human species by producing, storing, nourishing, and transporting functional male and female reproductive gametes, which remember are our sex cells. The basic components include our gonads, ducts, accessory glands, and organs, and external genitalia that are specific to the male and female, and we'll talk about them each uh, more in detail here. So the male gonads are the testes. They produce androgens or sex hormones, uh, spermatozoa, which are our sperm or male gametes, about a half a billion each day. Uh, during emission, sperm are going to travel along the duct system and they'll mix with secretions of those accessory glands to make semen. Semen will only be expelled uh, from the male body through ejaculation. Now, female gonads are the ovaries. They produce the oocytes or the female sex cells or gametes. They typically release only once per month. They travel the uterine tubes to the uterus. If you have sperm meeting with the oocyte, that uh, usually results in fertilization, resulting in an ovum. Um, the vagina is a short passageway connecting the uterus with the exterior so that uh, during sexual intercourse, semen can enter the vagina in order to help fertilization occur. If it does, the uterus will enclose and support a developing embryo as it grows into a fetus and prepares for birth. Now, we're going to get into both of these uh, reproductive systems separately, starting with Section 2, the male reproductive system. And the external genitalia that is for the male will be the scrotum. It encloses the testes and the penis, which is an erectile organ through which the distal portion of the urethra passes. The accessory glands that secrete their products into the ejaculatory ducts and the urethra include the seminal glands, the prostate gland, and the bulbo uh, urethral gland. Now the male reproductive tract is made up of the ependymis, um, and that is right here next to your testes. It will go up through the ductus deferens into the ejaculatory duct, which passes through the seminal gland, and then finally the urethra. And that's the pathway that sperm will travel um, and leave the body. Now the testes is the primary sex organ of the male system. It is located within the scrotum, like we mentioned, which is subdivided into two chambers containing each uh, testis. And it consists of a thin layer of skin containing smooth muscle known as a dartos muscle. It, it is continually contracting, which is what causes the wrinkling appearance of the surface of the scrotum. Uh, underneath that layer is a, a layer of skeletal muscle called the cremaster muscle, which is contracts to pull the testes closer to the body to help maintain uh, the temperature requirement for sperm development, which is about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Each testis is wrapped in a dense fibrous capsule or tunica albuginae. Uh, with, within each are approximately 800 slender, tightly coiled seminiferous tubules. And the sperm produced here leaves through a maze of passageways known as the rate testis. Now, there is something called uh, crypto. Uh, chitism, which is when one or both of the testes do not descend by the time of birth. This is usually uh, happens later or it can be fixed through um, surgery, which is usually not that big of an issue. Um, androgens and then our nurse cells, well, uh, spaces between the tubules that we just mentioned are filled with areolar tissue, numerous blood cells, and these large interstitial cells. Here is where those androgens are produced, and the most important one is testosterone that we'll talk more about here later. In each seminiferous tubule, there are large nurse cells. These uh, cells are also known as cestentacular or Sertoli cells. Uh, they nourish developing sperm cells, and between them are various cells that are involved in spermatogenesis or uh, the uh, making of sperm. Now, spermatogenesis involves three processes. It starts off with mitosis. These are mitotic divisions of stem cells, are spermatogonia. Um, they undergo mitosis through adult life. One daughter cell for each division differentiates into spermatocytes. It prepares for the next step, which is meiosis. Uh, we know this is a special form of cell division only involving gametes. Uh, each gamete will contain half the number of chromosomes, and they will produce immature gametes called spermatids. Uh, spermiogenesis is the last process. These are small, relatively unspecialized spermatids that developed eventually into the physical mature spermatozoa. Each sperm includes three distinct regions, a head, middle piece, and tail. The head contains a nucleus filled with the chromosomes, as, as well as the tip has enzymes for uh, getting into the egg or the oocyte. Uh, the middle piece has mitochondria that helps to move our tail, which is just a locomotive um, piece for the sperm to move around. It is the only example of flagellum in the human body. 
Now, those hormones that we mentioned are very important, uh, and basically the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the testes all work together to produce these hormones and to help the male reproductive system work as it should. So the hypothalamus is going to release gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, or GNRH. Um, once it does that, the GNRH is going to stimulate secretion of FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone, or LH. FSH is going to target primarily nurse cells, and LH is going to uh, target the interstitial cells of the testes. And what those do is, at least for the nurse cells under the FSH stimulation, they are going to help spermatogenesis occur. Um, the LH induces a secretion of testosterone and other androgens by the interstitial cells, and testosterone does all of these effects. It maintains libido, stimulates bone and muscle growth, establishes and maintains male secondary sex characteristics, and maintains the accessory glands and organs. Now, 19.3, we're going to get into the female parts. So, the principal organs involved are the ovaries, the uterine tubes, the uterus of the womb, and the vagina, while the external genitalia really only includes the vulva. Uh, the ovaries are small, lumpy, almond-shaped organs near the lateral walls of the pelvic cavity. They're responsible for the production of female gametes, or ova. Uh, secretion of female sex hormones includes estrogens and progestins. And secretion of inhibin is involved with negative feedback control of S FSH, which we will talk more about here later. Um, but you can see here your ovaries, uh, uterus, and as well as those uterine tubes that help pass on those oocytes into the uterus. Now, the uterine tubes and the uterus. Uh, the uterine tubes are also known as the fallopian tubes of the oviduct. Uh, they're roughly 13 centimeters in length. Uh, the oocytes are transported by a combination of cili ciliary movements and peristaltic contractions of the uterine tube wall. It takes about three to four days of travel to the uterine cavity. And if fertilization was to occur, the secondary oocyte must encounter sperm within the first 12 to 24 hours of the passage. If not, they basically just degenerate and disappear over time. Um, the uterus is a muscular chamber. It provides a mechanical protection and nutritional support for a developing embryo. The contractions of the walls are also important during delivery of the fetus. Now, oogenesis is the production of ovum, uh, or an egg cell. Uh, begins before a woman's birth, accelerates at puberty, and ends at menopause. Between puberty and menopause, oogenesis occurs in the ovaries each month as part of the ovarian cycle. Now, just a quick summary of oogenesis. The oogonia, or stem cells, complete mitotic divisions before birth. During fetal development, daughter cells, or the primary oocytes, undergo meiosis up to prophase of meiosis 1. And then they suspend until puberty. Hormonal signaling will restart that meiosis process, but only about 400,000 of those oocytes have survived. Uh, meiosis nuclear events differ from males in the following ways. Uh, cytoplasm is not distributed properly, so you get one functional ovum and up to three non-functional po uh, polar bodies. Um, the ovary doesn't release a mature gamete, but a mature ovum, or what we call a secondary oocyte. Um, this will only occur if fertilization occurs, otherwise the secondary mitotic uh, division does not complete. All right, so the ovarian cycle um, occurs in specialized structures called ovarian follicles. Uh, they are the sites of both oocyte growth and meiosis 1 of oogenesis. The follicles are ready to complete their maturation during the ovarian cycle, which occurs in two phases, so they're both 14 days apiece. Uh, the follicular phase results in the secondary oocyte that will not complete meiosis 2 again unless fertilized. Ovul ovulation is the release of the secondary oocyte by the tertiary follicle, and then the luteal phase can begin. Um, and it begins at the ovulation point, like I just said, and the empty follicle collapses, resulting in an endocrine structure called the corpus luteum. This will degenerate if fertilization doesn't occur, and then the new cycle will just begin all over again. Now, the uterine cycle is a menstrual cycle. It's a repeating series of changes in the structure of the endometrium, which is the epithelial uh, lining of the uterine cavity. So these two cycles actually occur with each other. Uh, the first cycle of the uterine cycle is known as a menarche, or the first menstrual period at puberty. It continues until age 50, 45 to 55 when the last menstrual cycle of menopause occurs. It lasts on average 28 days with three phases. Uh, the menses is degeneration of the endometrium due to decline in hormones. So tissue and blood ruptured from arterial walls will slough off. It's usually about a seven day period and it's known as menstruation. Then we have the proliferative phase. Uh, so days that follow the menses will repair the endometrium wall occurs. 
By the time ov ovulation occurs, the endometrium is several millimeters thick, and this is a point in time at which uh, usually a sperm could reach uh, an oocyte to uh, complete fertilization. The secretory phase is when the uterine glands enlarge, increasing secretions at the endometrium to prepare for the arrival of a developing embryo. And again, this will only continue if corpus luteum remains, otherwise the cycle just starts all over again. All right, um, hormones and female reproductive function. So again, we start off with the hypothalamus with that gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, and for the female's case, it produces and secretes FSH and LH as well, but they have different effects on the system. So as far as FSH, you're going to have follicle development, secretion of inhibin, and secretion of estrogens, which is the main uh, hormone of the female, and the specific name is estradiol, which is a dominant hormone uh, type. And what's it, what it's going to do is affect uh, the central nervous system, stimulate bone and muscle growth, establish and maintain female secondary sex characteristics, maintain accessory organs, and stimulate the endometrial growth and secretion. So very similar to the male, but just kind of slightly different needs based on the female system. Um, and then over here with that LH, it's going to help meiosis 1 to complete, ovulation to occur, and the corpus luteum to form. Uh, and then it will secrete progesterone and keep stimulating endometrial growth unless it's inhibited and then it will go back up to um, stopping or having negative feedback on that gonadotrophin uh, stimulating hormone depending on if fertilization occurs or not. <clears throat> this is more visual support for you. It, it was too big for me to actually put on the slide, but if you want to go back and look on page 661 and kind of see how the ovarian and lute luteal phase of the ovarian cycle work together, uh, it might help you uh, visualize what's going on a little bit better, and we will also talk about this more in class. I also have a table here that's in the book of the hormones of the reproductive system. It's just an overview of each of those hormones. Some of them overlap with the male and female. Some of them are very specific, so you might want to jot that down if that helps you as well. Um, the last two sections, uh, 19.4, talks about how the autonomic nervous system influences male and female sexual function. Uh, we know that sexual intercourse, it's also known as coitus, it introduces semen into the female reproductive tract. Um, male sexual function involved, uh, basically we have stimulation of sensory nerves in the general region to result in arousal, and then those sensory receptors, if stimulus continues, results in emission, which then leads to ejaculation. Um, ejaculation is associated with the male orgasm, which is uh, resulting from the pleasurable sensations. And then the inability of a male to maintain or achieve an erection is called impotence. Now, female sexual function occurs in the same way and, again, is controlled by the ANS. It's uh, largely comparable to the events with the males, but erection occurs in the female clitoris due to the stimulation of sensory receptors by the rhythmic con contact of the penis. Um, or orgasm is accompanied by peristaltic contractions of the uterine and vaginal walls. Now, 19.5 just talks about the effect of age. We mentioned it a little bit already with the female. Uh, we know that menopause does result due to a decline in circulating concentrations of estrogen and progesterone, um, an increase in the gonadotrophin uh, releasing hormone FSH and LH will occur, and then this is linked to osteoporosis and hot flashes. The hot flashes are usually a result of uh, the FSH and LH increase. And um, some females, this is very mild. Some, it's very severe, and they could need um, hormone uh, therapy. And then males, they have andropause or male uh, climateric. Uh, this is a decline in testosterone production, which usually results in a decline in sexual activity. Uh, 196 just talks about how um, the other body systems affect the reproductive system and vice versa. So I just suggest you go to page 671, create a table overview, just brief notes how each system plays a role in affecting or being affected by the reproductive system. Otherwise, you are done. You can go back and pause and play as needed. And I will see you guys in class.